right, so I'll do a little bit of uh, kind of wrap up some of those questions on those, those that set of questions I have posted on Canvas. But I also want to mention a couple things <clears throat> before we get going. So if we look, so we've got that kind of fifth assignment that's due at the end of the day tomorrow. So what I'll do after that due date passes, um, I'll try to get those graded relatively quick. I kind of mentioned this was kind of like a replacement um, in that I'm going to drop your lowest homework, right? So you know, if you missed one or didn't do good on one, but you do the fifth one and you do well, right? It'll like replace that grade. So once this is done on Canvas, I think I can show you with another section I have. So in this class is a different class, but they had these things called learn smart assignments. They had what, six of them. I dropped the lowest. So then on Canvas, I put kind of what looked like a new assignment there that gave you kind of that grade in that category. So I'll be posting one that says, you know, homework grade or, or you know, total homework grade that basically reflects the fact that I've dropped the lowest of those five, or, you know, if you don't do the fifth one, but you did the first four, right? Not, nothing should change there. But if you do the fifth one, it's better than you know, one of the other ones, it'll replace it and I'll drop the lowest. So they'll have something like that up there. I'll also probably tomorrow, it should appear up there. I'll do a similar thing, but drop your, I think the, the syllabus stated the two lowest kind of online quizzes. So if you missed a couple, kind of those will get dropped and your, your grade there might, might increase a little bit as well. So I'll kind of have something that looks similar to this for our section. Like I said, for the online quizzes, probably tomorrow, but those fifth, you know, homework's probably not till early in, in the week next week. Okay. Um, other than that, the, um, I'm probably re reiterating things I said last class, but that exam will show up on Canvas uh, Monday. I'll probably have it so it pops up at like 9 a.m. And then if you want to get at any point Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday to take that exam, once you start, right, you'll have two hours to kind of complete and submit that exam. Uh, that includes kind of uploading your work for the short answer questions. So currently, I, I'm still tweaking it a little bit, um, but it's going to be roughly five to six short answer, kind of with, some of them have multiple parts. Uh, and then probably around 12, like I said, maybe one, you know, 13 or 11, somewhere around there, uh, multiple choice, okay? Show as much work as you possibly can in those short answers so I can give as much partial credit as possible there, all right? The questions will look pretty similar to the homework. I would say some of the homework questions are a little bit more open-ended. Um, and even the questions we've been working through here Tuesday than today, a little bit more open-ended and vague just so we can kind of explore some of the principles as we're working through these. Uh, on the exam, they'll be a little bit more um, exact in what they're looking for. Right? I think I mentioned that. So let's pull up those final practice problems. Um, I'll work through the ones that we didn't do on Tuesday. Uh, but before I start, is, is there any kind of questions? I, I, I should uh, also, I was gonna mention, um, I'm going to start tomorrow sitting down and kind of going through your project. So you should start to see your, your, those grades will kind of pop up um, depending on where, where you're at alphabetically. <laughs> um, so I'll probably start at the beginning of the alphabet. And then for the final, when I grade that, I'll start at the end. So that way, you know, if you're on either side, I guess if you're in the middle, you, <laughs> you're out of luck. But so um, I kind of want to mention that as well. So are there any questions kind of before we, we jump into things here? Let's see how. Okay, let me see. No, it's all right. I got it. Okay, so, right, this question, what it's asking, obviously, because it's still due tomorrow, I can't work through, but I'll, I'll kind of, if you, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. So, what would you expect the wages of schools like Louisiana Tech or Ball State? Um, or I guess, grammatically, you're correct. So this should have been, what, what would you expect um, of the wages at, at Louisiana Ball compared to schools like IU, PY, and Tulane? Okay. So, so, yeah, so I guess here, saying, what would you expect, what you expect? of the weight? Yeah, what would you expect 
of the wages might make a little more sense, all right? You're comparing kind of these smaller city schools to the larger city schools. So you don't have like four schools here. You have this, you know, I'm using these as examples. So you're basically comparing kind of small city schools relative to kind of uh, schools that have larger populations. Yep. Yep. All right. Any other questions before we kind of start and jump into these? Okay, um, so we did one, two, and three, I believe. So we'll kind of start with the multiple choice questions again, again, and then kind of make our way into the short answer. So on a question like four, if the players in the league are bargaining for the number of preseason games, right? The league is you know, willing to accept anything over two. I guess this example doesn't make as, as uh, you know, maybe is, is, doesn't line up with now that things are changing, but if they would accept anything over two and the union won't accept any number above four, right? So that's kind of the setup. But then we have the league being overly optimistic about what the union would accept and thinks the union would really accept anything, you know, below six or up to five. So which of the following are true, right? What's going to happen? Well, let's just draw this out and kind of think about this even before we look at the answers. We should be able to come up with like if this was a short answer question. Wait for the dot cam to catch up here. All right, there we go. So, and just a kind of reminder, we're working on number four here. So what we have is the union, the reality is they would accept any, any number of games four or below. You then kind of have, you think about the league, right? So we'll call this, here's kind of the league's threat point was two. The union's threat point was four, right? So without the optimism, the number of games they'll come to an agreement are is either gonna be two, and I guess here, this is the number of games, you know, technically this isn't continuous, so it'd be either two, three, or four, right? Somewhere in the range of two to four. So if we believe that the league is overly optimistic, so they think that the number of games that the union would be willing to accept, accept is five or anything below it, right? They have incorrect beliefs. What could this potentially lead to, right? Well, if the, if the league believes this, right, and it's thinking about, okay, what number of games am I gonna propose? You know, maybe it, it still chooses three or four games because it doesn't wanna get too close to that threat point. And, you know, maybe if they, you know, were optimistic, they, you know, they didn't wanna offer something too high, but with these optimistic beliefs, it now, opens up the possibility that the league does offer, say, five games, and the union set, comes back and says, that's, that's too high, that's you know, above our threat point, we won't accept it. And so potentially, we could see that union kind of going on strike, right? But even if it doesn't get to that point, right, even if the league's optimistic beliefs doesn't, you know, they don't offer five, maybe they offer something like four. Well, the union would accept that, right? But right? The, the league kind of loses out, I guess, on if we want to think about loses out on surplus or the idea that you know, the league would like the number of preseason games to be as high as possible. But, you know, if I offer kind of four here, sorry, I, the league offers four. Sorry, I, I, I had that backwards, right? The union's going to lose out, right? Because this overly optimistic belief lets the league think, oh, I can, I can offer something a little bit higher than three or a little bit higher than four, right? Or, you know, right at four. And so they start proposing offers that are higher than they were before, which the union will still accept three and four games, but, right, they're going to lose out on some surplus. So being optimistic, in a sense, could be good because I'm more likely to offer these higher number of games as the league. And if I, you know, offer three or four games, the union will still accept that. The union loses out in surplus, the, the league is better off. But if I'm too optimistic and I offer a number of games of five here past the threat point, the union could come back at me and, and say, that's too high, we're gonna, we're gonna strike, right? So regardless of whether or not they proposed four or five games there, the league is potentially, you know, potentially could propose a number of games that's too high, right? That would be proposing five games, which is above that threat point. So, you know, another way I could have said this, the league potentially proposes a number of games, not just that's too high, right? I could have said even that results in a strike, 
right? It, kind of a similar idea there, but, but just two different ways of saying the same thing. Any questions on that one? Um, I want to add something in here. What if, let's say instead, we think about the union is pessimistic, right? So maybe the, the union knows that the league likes to offer, right? Or sorry, wants to make an offer that leads to more preseason games. So what if the union believed that the league, right? So we can kind of call this like, I, I am not going to spell this right, but pessimistic, right? Um, I, I definitely spelling is not my, my forte. So let's say they believe the league wouldn't accept, you know, is only willing to accept not everything over two, but only willing to accept a number of games four or higher. Well, this pessimism, right? If the, if the union looks at this and says, well, well, geez, I mean, the only thing we could ever agree on with them would be a number of games of four. So they propose, right? The, the union would kind of propose four games based on their pes pessimism, which ultimately just hurts the league, right? Or sorry, hurts the union because the union really wanted something below, like four below, right? So this was literally offer their threat point so this pessimism would also kind of lead to the union losing out on surplus, right? And potentially, similar idea, if their pessimism was too large and they believe that the league wouldn't accept anything below five, they might say, well, we're just not going to come to an agreement. So until the, you know, the league moves that threat point from five back to you know, four, three, or two, or one, we're, we're just going to go on strike. So the pessimism could potentially also lead to a strike, right? Pessimism by the union could lead to a strike or a number of games that kind of hurts the unions, whereas optimism by the league kind of had similar impacts, right? So kind of thinking about these contract zones and, you know, I guess, you know, finding the range of values I think is relatively easy once we have these threat points, but how this optimism and pessimism could, could lead to like some undesirable outcomes would, would be a, kind of both fair game, optimism or pessimism, right? Okay. Any questions over anything? I see the chat. Huh? Yeah, sorry, I could have written up here. This was um, league optimism. I guess if we wanted to really get this, this was like the union's views of the league. So, Union had a pessimistic view of the league. The league had an optimistic view of, of the union. Okay. Yep, so right. Yeah, so the true union kind of threat point is five. The league was optimistic and thought it was, it was or sorry, true one was four. The league was optimistic and thought it was five. Yep. Okay. When you say they're op, oh, the, um, that the league has to have optimism about. Yeah, so it's basically, if this wasn't league union, it's party one has optimism about party two's beliefs. Party two has pessimism or optimism about party one's beliefs. Yep. yep. Yeah, so let's say, and I'll repeat the question here in just a second for these ones. Zoom. So let's say we've got, right, So let's say that the uh, league had a pessimistic view of the union, right? This is actually kind of a, a weird one. The results kind of play out kind of interesting. So let's say that the league is pessimistic, right? They want more games, but they believe the union would only accept three or lower. Well, the league looks at this and says, well, we, we want to come to an agreement with them. We're okay with three games. So the league would, you know, propose three games. So what's the, the result of... Uh, the leagues, I right, hold on, pessimism. I, I, this is probably not even close. Okay. <laughs> so pessimism, All right? They proposed three games. The union would accept that, right? But what, what did the league do? Well, their own pessimism, right? Uh, led to the league 
kind of losing out in surplus, right? Because they could have gotten away with proposing four games. Right? And if their pessimism got too bad, like let's say I kind of didn't leave myself enough room, but let's say they thought, right? I was like over here, like they would only accept, you know, one game or, or, or lower, one or zero games. Well, then that potentially could lead to the league, you know, instituting a lockout where they say, well, look, we're not okay with just one game. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're going to call, uh, we're going to have a lockout. We're going to stop these, this bargaining. Um, when in reality, the union would have actually accepted something that was, was low. Excuse me. It, it could happen. It, it could happen that they had pessimism about the union. Um, it just, it's just not what the, that specific question, right? We could do any combination. So we could do league optimism or pessimism about the union, and we could do union optimism or pessimism about the league. Yep. Um, okay. So number five. So why might the NBA paying lower wages be an example of gender discrimination. So I, I probably could phrase this a little differently. I probably would if I had you know, taken more time like I have with writing the exam, but I might say something like, which of the, the following scenarios would be an example of um, gender discrimination if the WNBA had lower wages? Right? So lower wages despite all these things. So we could analyze each one of them independently. Um, so I guess we can, we can kind of go ahead and do that. So the first one, you know, they have lower wages despite having higher attendance. Well, we kind of already discussed this a little bit last class. We really don't have to analyze this one too much because wages are based off of, right? We think about that demand curve for labor. How does that shift? Well, it was the marginal revenue per win times the marginal wins that come from that labor. Well, marginal revenue, right? Revenue is, a, is Composed, like we said, total revenue is really composed of two things, prices and quantity. So attendance, attendance would just tell us something about the quantity of ticket sales, tells us nothing about the price. Right? So that one doesn't, you know, we really can't make any statements. AA doesn't really, we don't have to analyze any further. We don't have enough information there, right? To actually say there'd be discrimination. I think the second one, higher supply of females than males, right? So if we're thinking about this labor market, and we could even assume, right, because all we have there given is, is that there's differences in supply, right? So even if we assume that demand was exactly the same in the WNBA and the NBA, oh, my talking guys right here. So let's assume that demand was the same. Um, and we have supply in the NBA here. So we could identify kind of equilibrium wages in the NBA or on average the kind of wage. Well, if there's a higher supply, right? An increase in supply looks like this. So if the supply is higher in the WNBA, well then actually if we see lower wages, this isn't discrimination. This is actually just a result of there being higher supply. So this is an, an example where we could say that discrimination is potentially the cause. Right? Now, if we had discrimination, right, it's just gonna force the wage that we see to be lower, but it, it, just knowing that there's difference in supply doesn't allow us to make any statements about the wages. Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> um, now the, the second scenario, I think says something about the marginal revenue per win, right? So despite having a higher marginal revenue per win, well, this is really solving the solution or the solving the problem that we had with A is we, should, we didn't have information about marginal revenue, right? We just had information about one of the components, just quantity, just the quantity. Well, now we're told the marginal revenue per win is higher in the WNBA. So that means that we're going to have a increase in our demand curve. Right? So this one really, you know, if we, you probably draw this out pretty quick and I probably won't label this one quite as extensively, but right. We've got demand in the MBA, right? And we just said if the marginal revenue per win is higher, or sorry, <laughs> I already labeled these wrong. Let's try to do it real quick. 
sorry, we said we had demand in the NBA. We knew that demand in the WNBA was going to be higher because the marginal revenue per win was higher. Here, we don't have any, you know, aren't told anything about supply differences. So we'll assume kind of supply in the NBA is the same as in the WNBA. Right? So what that's going to do You identify those two equilibrium wages. This would predict that wages in the WNBA are higher. So if we you know, see lower wages in the WNBA under this scenario, it would have to be that, I can't ran out of room here. So the demand for the WNBA plus this discrimination cost, well, then we would expect to see wages in the WNBA with this discrimination, we would see that that wages were lower. Hmm? Yeah, so, so if there was no, like, so this is the, the, we're trying to identify which of these scenarios would, if we saw lower wages, be a result or, or be a potential candidate for where there could be discrimination going on. Well, without the discrimination, we should see higher wages. So if we do see lower wages in the WNBA, you know, potentially, you know, maybe it comes from supply differences here, but it is at least a scenario where discrimination could kind of predict that we see, you know, if, if we did see lower wages, that that would have to be a result of discrimination or, or, or you know, something else. In the other scenario, even if we had discrimination, it didn't, didn't really matter because the supply differences um, already predicted lower wages. In this one, the marginal revenue differences don't you know, don't depict lower wages in the end, but they actually predict higher wages. So the only way that we should see lower wages is if, if there was some discrimination. Yeah, well, the way I drew this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be a pretty pretty sizable taste for discrimination. And then um, kind of really just works in the exact opposite. You know, if we had lower marginal productivity or, or kind of on average, the number of additional wins that the labor added in the NBA or WNBA is lower. Well, it's actually going to be the one that I was drawing that was right here. Because if my demand curve for labor is the marginal revenue per win times marginal wins coming from labor, and I'm now told in the WNBA, this is lower, that shifts my demand curve down. You know, if we're, if we're looking at wages here, well, now I've got predicted wages in the WNBA are lower. So if I see they're lower, well, I expected them to be. Now, it could be that there is still discrimination going on, right? And it just pushes the wages lower. But under this scenario, I can't determine that just by looking at, at kind of whether or not the wages are lower or not. I don't know what that gap should be without any more information. So if I'm predicting wages should be lower, well, even without discrimination here, I'm predicting they should be lower. Right? And, and like I said, on, on the exam, I'd probably write this question a little bit a little bit differently, but I wanted to try to have like three different things that we could think about shifting either the demand or supply curve in the labor market and how what they would predict. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So that's the only one in which seeing lower wages could be a result of discrimination. Mm -hmm. In fact, this brings up a good point. Let's go to C. Uh, is that what I want to do? I want to show you an example of. Okay, let's do. Let's do this one. So let's do C. But instead of a really large size of discrimination, right? Let's say I said that you saw that there were higher wages in the WNBA. So that must be evidence that there's no discrimination. Not quite, right? Because even if we had, we know the demand curve in the WNBA is higher, but even if we had some discrimination, but it was really small, we would still see higher wages in the WNBA. So just because we see higher wages in the WNBA, doesn't rule out discrimination if we have that additional component that the marginal revenue per win is higher, right? Now, the more likely scenario is probably that the NBA is higher, um, you know, but if, if this was the situation, 
just because we see higher wages in the NBA, WNBA, doesn't mean we have no discrimination, right? We just can't pick that up, right? Because the, if the discrimination is small, we're still going to predict higher wages. We just don't know if they are high enough. Yeah. You could, yeah. So the, 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 I mean, if we run, ran some regressions where we tried to pick up, but I think we looked at the one paper where they tried to estimate this. You can easily estimate how much the number of additional wins each player adds. And then we could do something like look at the distribution of the NBA versus the WNBA. My guess is it's similar. Um, if we had like, although I don't know off the top of my head how many games the WNBA plays, but if we could like equate the number of games, right, this would probably be similar. We could then look at the marginal revenue kind of per win, look at revenues for these different, and then we could come up with what the demand curves should be, look at the actual wage data and, and do something there. Like you could even run a regression on what this would predict the wage would be. And then kind of the difference between that and the actual wage. Because their, their paper, the, they specifically looked at whether uh, or not pay, players were being paid more or less than their predicted wage. We would do a similar thing here. Just now we have two leagues. All right. Okay, so this one, I actually will, will answer the question, but then I will throw a wrinkle in it uh, to try to kind of get at a principle here. So suppose we've got 30 NHL teams, half discriminate against Canadian born players and half aren't. Suppose a player whose value of their marginal productive labor is worth $10 million to every team. So kind of every team, right, has the same demand for this player, right? The same value of the marginal productive labor outside of discrimination, okay? So suppose, suppose we're looking at a Canadian born player, which of the following would we expect, right? Do they end up on the discriminating or the non-discriminating team and how much are they making, right? So we'll answer this one, but then I'll kind of change it a little bit and show you how it could be a little bit different. So this is six. So we're thinking about, we now have this player, right? The demand curve should be the same across all teams, right? He should be worth that $10 million to every team. We've got his supply, right? You can almost think about it as Right at that equilibrium, he's worth $10 million to every team. Right? However, he's Canadian, so every team out there that's discriminating, right, would maybe, and I'll just come up with a number here for the sake of it, right? Let's say they, they pay him something less. I'll choose $5 million here, right? So, um, you know, if I'm thinking about if I've got half the teams that are discriminating, half aren't, well, all the non-discriminating teams are going to be in competition to get this player and his equilibrium wage will just be exactly 10 million, right? So this one, really not a difficult question. Um, shouldn't end up on the discriminating team because the wages are going to be lower, right? And because there's 15 teams that are non-discriminating, right? I said half are discriminating, half aren't. That's enough competition for us Right, to, well, didn't get the first part of this, but that's enough competition for us to know he'll make exactly what their worth, his worth is. Because, yeah, because as long as I have, really, I don't even need 15 teams here. All I need is two. As long as I have competition for this player, right? If I, so this is the idea. Exactly. As long as there's two, right, maybe team one comes and says, ah, well, let's say there's 28 other teams that are discriminating. Well, I know every other team is only going to pay him five. I'll offer him 5.5. Well, then the second non-discriminating team says, well, he's st still worth way more than that to us. So he's still like we're paying less than the value, right? So we'll go six. And then the other team come back, and we'll go all the way up to that value that he's worth, right? Now, he, the scenario that gets interesting is what if we only have one non-discriminating team. Well, if this is the only non-discriminating team, they look at this scenario and say, well, look, we could pay him 5.1 million, you know, 5 million one cent, right? We could make an offer that's just barely above 5 million. And that's going to be more attractive to that player than any other team will offer because of their discrimination. Um, 
so in that scenario, you know, if we only had one team, so let's say we only had one team that was kind of non-discriminatory, well, then he'd still end up on the non-discriminatory team, but the wage was going to be something that's less than 10, right? So we don't, I didn't give you that 5 million is for, you know, so we just know it's going to be somewhere below 10. Yeah, but the, the key here is as long as we have two non-discriminating teams, that's enough to compete with each other to get that wage back up to whatever, whatever the, the equilibrium wage should be without discrimination. Any other questions on that? So I was looking at this before class. So on four, I'm going to change this one a little bit because it would, it's very similar to one. And there's something in here that I think will be is good to know before before taking the final. So suppose the answer is well, keep on the team similar. All right. So instead of just, just teams, uh, sorry, instead of teams keeping all the money and not sharing it with the conference, I kind of combined two things here. So I said, I suppose that. Um, in football, they, they, you know, the payouts are kept by the team and not shared. And then they also start, uh, you know, having this thing where there's guaranteed bowl spots for, for winners of every conference, every conference. Sorry. Well, we kind of went through last class, the effects of keeping all the money. So it'd really be this, you know, similar effects. So let's say instead that we just have the NCAA football changing to be more like NCAA basketball where they guarantee bowl spots for the winner of every conference. But they still have to share revenue with the conference. And I'm doing this because we already worked through an example where we went from not sharing, or sorry, sharing to not sharing. I want to do one that kind of goes in the opposite direction. Right? So this... Yeah, so if you pull up the assignment right now, it is whatever it was. For the sake of like what we're going to go through in class right now, I'm going to change a little bit. Okay. Yep. So we now have this scenario where, yeah, teams were already sharing revenue. So there's no change going on there. The only change that we're going to be analyzing is they now are giving guaranteed bowl spots to the winner of every single conference. Okay. So how is this going to impact competitive balance within the Power Five? within the non-Power 5 conferences and then across the league. Okay. So if we think here, right, we're going from a scenario where maybe some of these lower, we'll kind of do the easier ones first probably. So this is problem four, short answer. If we think about within the Power 5 conferences, right, we're now, you know, <laughs> if we have automatic bowl spots for the winner of every conference, well, what's probably true about the team that wins one of these power five conferences. They're the best, but even without, like, let's say that the league didn't make this change. Well, they would have been going to a bowl game anyways, right? Like, so, so that kind of um, guarantee for the winner to go to a bowl game, it doesn't really have any impact on the power, on, on those top teams in the power five. So just that change is probably not going to cause competitive balance in the power five to change at all. Right? However, if we look at within the non-Power 5, and I said every conference here, so this includes like, uh, I don't even know some of the names of, of, of the conferences like that are uh, out west or in the kind of south or kind of east. They've got teams that, or sorry, there's conferences where you might not even recognize the team names, right? But their winner is now guaranteed, right? That would be like, uh, you know, um, Oh, what's a good example in Indiana that's made it? That would be like Valparaiso University, right? Whatever conference they're in, because it's similar in basketball. That's, they've made it in before because they wonder that's what's going to happen now. So those top teams in the non-Power 5 probably weren't getting into a bowl game before, even if they won their, their conference. Now they are. So if they're still sharing kind of money with the rest of their conference, well, within the Power 5, right, they're now sharing that revenue we might not see any change there either, right? Because every team is getting the same amount of revenue. So this is kind of a tricky, this is why I changed it, right? It's kind of tricky, right? Because this change really didn't impact 
kind of the top teams, right? Or it didn't impact the top teams of the power five. And even though it impacted the non-power five, well, they're still sharing revenue. Now, if it had been the original question where I said, now every team is guaranteed a bowl game if they win their conference and they don't have to share, well, now competitive balance will get worse in the non-power five because those teams that make it keep all the money. And similar kind of idea with the, with the power five. So how could it improve competitive balance within the conferences? So in order for it to improve competitive balance within either the power five or the non-power five, you would have to do something like, hmm, you would have to do something like not just where you guarantee the winner of every conference, but maybe you guarantee that every conference would have, well, no, if we're, if we're sharing revenue equally, there's really nothing you can do to improve competitive balance, right? Unless you did something goofy that's not really practical, like, you know, uh, there is revenue sharing, but the bottom teams in the league get a larger percentage than, than the, the top teams, right? You'd have to do something like that, which I guess, I guess I said it's not practical. It could, I mean, it's possible. Um, the conference, you know, usually that wouldn't come from the NCAA. It'd probably come like from within the conference where the conf, you know, Big Ten or someone says, we're going to take this money and the, the NCAA says we have to share it, but like if they don't share it, say we have to, you know, share it equally, like can we go even higher, <laughs> right? Can I give 60% to the lowest quality team and only 40 to the top? I, I don't know exactly what the NCAA rule is. I think it's that it's shared equally, but if they just say that it has to at least be shared equally, maybe we see something like that. But yeah, not, not a lot of things there that would kind of improve competitive balance, at least within the conferences. Because if we think, about what's going to happen to competitive balance across the league. Well, now, if we have, um, you know, we didn't really have much of a change in the power five, but now within the power, non-power five, we said those best teams will make it to bowls where they might not have before. And then they share that revenue equally with every other team in the conference. So our non-power five, we would expect every team to get better because they're going to have at least their, their conference winner go get some money and then come back and share it with everybody. But then the power five, well, that was already occurring, right? There's no, this is guaranteed, didn't really change anything because those power five at least have one team going every single year. So your power five, your, your power five teams are kind of like, kind of staying in, in, in a similar position. Exactly, there was no change, right? So now, those non-power five teams improving, we actually would probably, you know, the likely would be that we see non-power five teams getting better. Power five teams, really, there was no change. And so we would see competitive balance improve. Yeah, right. The, I mean, the, the, the implications of like, if we made this a dynamic thing where we look at like the next five or 10 years, right, that could, could be wildly different because as they get better, um, they start to attract more recruits. Maybe the lower quality teams here start to get a little bit worse, right? This, yeah, you could, you could take this out if you wanted to, but really we're just thinking about kind of the immediate impacts in that, in that, in that year that that occurs. Any questions on that? Also, this looks kind of janky. I have my remote. Let's see if I can find the remote here. I don't see it. Well, if you, if you can't read anything that I'm writing, please let me know. I, to me, at least, it looks a little bit blurry. So, all right. Um, so, like I said, I changed that one a little bit. So, suppose that – so, so five is more of a thought experiment without being uh, real specific. But the idea with five that I was kind of thinking about um, and wanted to kind of get you to start to think about is – if we're thinking about schools having the ability to pay their athletes or offer scholarships, right? What characteristics might be linked more with um, teams being more likely to offer wages as opposed to scholarships? So if we think about um, schools for which it makes sense to pay their players, right? If they're trying to be competitive, this would be teams that can offer those player higher players, higher wages, right? So if, 
we've got a school where the wage would be uh, greater than kind of our tuition remission or you know what the value of kind of that that scholarship these are going to be schools that will then offer the wage because if they don't well they know that there's other schools out there can, that can offer wages higher than tuition and so the players will go there so to be competitive if the wage that i can offer that player that equilibrium wage is greater than the tuition amount then i would choose to be paying the wages right if the reverse is true and that the equilibrium wage i can pay the player is less than the value of the tuition I could offer them. Well, that means I probably have a relatively lower wage. And so offering the tuition remission is going to be more attractive to that player. So we're really thinking about um, what schools will be able to offer higher wages and what schools will be off, you know, offering lower, sorry, I saw the word higher and I started writing it, lower wages. Right? And this just gets at, we want to think about what's shifting the demand curve, right? And primarily that shift is gonna be from the marginal revenue per win. Right? So we're thinking about players of similar quality. What are the kind of characteristics we've seen shift that demand curve? Right? So I've used a few of them in the examples that we've went through. So if we think about schools that are being able to offer higher wages, this is gonna be schools like um, oh, D1 schools, right? That have kind of higher uh, demand curves probably men's football and basketball. Right. We could even think about, you know, this, what also might lead to, to higher wages. Um, this is kind of a weird one to think about, but we said that, and this was in homework uh, four, right? When we're thinking about schools like Stanford, they actually face a higher supply curve in the sense that the opportunity cost of going to other schools is higher. So their supply curve kind of shifts in, right? Or decreases. So that, sh that decrease in supply, just to kind of give you a visual, right? If the supply is decreased, that's gonna predict higher wages, right? So actually another characteristic we could even think about is actually the uh, low academic quality schools, right? there's a higher opportunity cost to going there, right? Because you're foregoing like a high quality education or degree. And so we would actually predict that they would have higher equilibrium wages. So they'd be more likely to have a wage above the tuition remission as well. Uh, whereas the schools that wouldn't, right? Would choose to go with a tuition instead of, of paying wages are kind of like your smaller kind of football programs, maybe D or smaller programs, D3. Um, you know, you're not as popular sports. I pick on bowling a lot, but you know, that's one of them. Um, and then kind of here we have the high academic quality, right? And kind of thinking about this, like the value of their degree is worth so much that, you know, they don't have this huge opportunity cost. So their supply curve is relatively low. So their wages might actually end up being a little bit below what their scholarship or their tuition remission would be. Um, so there was a question on homework, like I said, there's questions on homework four that try to get at a lot of these things, but starting to think about the qualities, like what shifts those demand and supply curves and what predicts higher wages, really we're usually thinking about differences between D1, D2, D3 programs, men's football and basketball versus really every other sport. We're gonna see kind of that shift. And then kind of we had that academic quality that we could see shifting that as well. And I think even in homework five, the question you asked about to start class number one, we could even think about here, not just academic quality, right? But if universities have something that students value, so not just the, the degree, but maybe, um, you know, I don't know, living in a city of, you know, living in Chicago versus living in uh, Muncie, Indiana, or something like that, right? That potentially we could see shifts in the supply curve due to those, those preferences as well. If those preferences are like expected to be pretty, uh, like the pretty except like a uh, representative of every player, right? And I'm probably on the exam. I would give you, I'd be very specific that, you know, this is something that on average, most players or most college athletes would highly value. Okay. All right. And that kind of leads us into the similar discussion. So six, 
let's say we allow teams to pay players, right? What would happen to the equilibrium wage paid to and the number of high quality players on high and low revenue generating football programs? Use a graph. This one really shouldn't be too difficult for us. So we're thinking about there's differences. So 6A here. Even if we had the exact same supply curve, we had here the demand for low revenue. We know that high revenue generating programs should have a higher demand curve for labor because, oh, even if it's of the same quality, remember the number of additional wins they add, you can kind of think about this as the quality of the player. So if it's a higher revenue generating team, their demand curve for labor should be higher, right? And we should see that, you know, the prediction is they see uh, higher wages. Eight, no. My brain's not working. Low revenue, the wage of the low revenue teams, right? So I'm not saying I'm doing this on the exam, but I'm saying I could wink, wink, right? I've got most of it written. So one thing that we haven't combined, but we have an understanding of the principles such that we could, is let's say I said they, you know, we assume that NCAA put, uh, is going to allow schools to pay players. You know, which schools, right? And then I had to give you like maybe the high revenue generating programs. We think maybe there's some discrimination, right? explain how lower revenue generating programs could potentially end up with these high quality players. Well, if I've got discrimination, right? If it was large enough and it's only really existing at these high revenue generating programs, potentially it pushes that demand curve down low enough. So add in that discrimination, right? It's an additional cost. Potentially it gets it low enough to where then the wage at these high revenue places with discrimination actually ends up being lower than the lower revenue generating schools. And so here, this is weird. I should, this is a weird thing to even propose, but I, I, so that, that could occur with the discrimination. And then I, maybe I could ask you a question like, how would this impact competitive balance? Well, this is a weird one in which if discrimination is solely at these higher revenue generating programs, we actually get that this could improve competitive balance because now the wages at lower revenue generating programs are higher, the higher quality players will choose to go there and we, we get kind of this improvement in competitive balance, which in this, in the, you know, <laughs> hopefully any reasonable person says, well, but to hell with competitive balance, like we should solve the discrimination issue. We don't really care about competitive balance, but um, just that tying those principles together, I think that is an example here that we haven't really thought about tying into the NCAA market, but it works the same way as with the professional leagues, right? The discrimination is just going to kind of shift uh, those demand curves. Uh, B kind of asked, well, you know, we don't have discrimination in this problem. So without the discrimination, what impact would it have on competitive balance? Well, if we start allowing these, these schools to pay players, your higher revenue programs are always going to be able to offer a higher wage to, to top quality players and then kind of allow them to improve even more. Lower revenue generating programs, lower quality players, they, they generate you know, even less. And we kind of see this competitive balance get worse, right? That gap between the two grow, that quality gap. Okay. So here we would think about this kind of hurts competitive balance really across the entire league and across the Power Five conferences. But across the Power Five, may, maybe not as much because revenues are, are more similar. Um, but, but even such, you would see the higher revenue generating programs within each conference be the ones that kind of uh, would, ha would ha be able to offer the higher wage. Yeah, I like that, uh, like I said, I'm not telling you it's on there, but I, I like the idea of combining like an example like this with some discrimination going on at the collegiate level. Okay, so now let's assume the NFL eliminates the rule that players must be two years removed from high school to play in the NFL. Using your answer from part A, depict how this could potentially eliminate all high quality players from being on low revenue generating programs. Okay. So you're now allowing um, uh, players to kind of leave early, right? So now players have an option between choosing the wage that they could get in the NCAA and the wage they could get in the NFL. Right? 
So we'll go back here. So these are kind of our, our collegiate schools, right? So eh, which color do I want to use? We'll go here. So if this is the scenario, and because we've already got dry, you could redraw this. And actually, I think I'm running out of paper here. I didn't bring enough. So let me see if I've got a sheet of paper I left blank here because I would like to redraw this. Well, we'll just try to save it. I think I've got enough room down here. I got yeah, I got some notepad paper up here I might might resort to, but so let's say what I've got going on is kind of here's my supply curve. And I'm thinking about here's the NC A. Here's my demand curve for the NCAA. Okay. So probably would want a little more information on this problem. I would probably give you an assumption, which is that assume that the demand curve in the NFL is a little bit higher, right? So here we've got kind of our equilibrium wage in the NCAA. Right? If the demand curve was higher in the NFL, right, then potentially, right, we, we would think, okay, there's going to be higher wages in the NFL and that that's going to lead to, you know, these players leaving the NCAA, joining the NFL, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe if I had drawn two differences here, like maybe this is representative of low revenue generating programs and maybe the higher generating programs have demand that's the same as the NFL, which would, you know, predict that, okay, then then the players will stay on the high revenue programs, but the wage offered at these lower revenue generating programs, they're just going to leave and go to the NFL. Right? So that's kind of, identifying whether or not there's differences in, you know, for the high and, and low revenue generating programs. I'd probably give you a little more information about like, you know, the demand for the high generating programs is similar to NFL, whereas the lower generating programs, you know, it's lower. And then you would just kind of draw on that the demand curve is higher and you would predict that, oh yeah, they'd be more likely to leave. However, even if we're going to compare to those high revenue generating programs, so even if I told you, assume the high revenue programs are also lower than the NFL. So maybe we have a scenario like this where, yeah, here's my wage in the NCAA for low revenue programs, high revenue. Well, they're both lower than the wage at the NFL level, so there's no way they can compete, right? Well, there's also one other thing that we haven't really factored in, which is that if these players leave to go to the NFL, what is their opportunity cost? the value of their degree, right? They're, they're not going to have that degree. And so it could potentially be that with a higher cost in the NFL, we also see, I'm going to try to draw this perfectly if I, if I can. So here's my demand curve. I'm a little off, I think. So let's say, you know, with that additional opportunity cost, the supply is a little bit lower in the NFL, like relative to the NCAA, because, you know, these players thinking about going, even if they're high quality, the NFL is not a sure thing. Like I want to have the value of that degree. So I'd be losing out on that. And you kind of can see, I try to draw this right at the same point because with both of these things, right, we would predict that we would see, you know, much, much higher wages in the NFL. But in terms of would we see any change in the equilibrium quantity of players going from, from you know, if I'm comparing the number of players in the NFL to the NCAA, well, the quantities could be the same. Now, if I didn't draw that supply shift as much, you know, maybe the quantities are a little bit higher. If I draw it even more, quantities are lower. But in no scenario will this ever predict wages will be lower, right? So this kind of go, goes back to analyzing two impacts. If I see demand increases here, what impact does demand increase have? What pushed the wage up? So demand increases, increased wage, and it also increased kind of the quantity of labor we would see. However, this supply decrease was also pushing wages up, but it was pushing the quantity of labor kind of back, right? So we can't really say anything about the number of players kind of in the NFL relative to the NCAA, but we can say that both of these things would predict higher wages. And like I said, in the exam, I'd be a little bit more precise about kind of what you know, the differences in the demand curve were. 
And I'd probably also even mention something about um, that joining the NFL, the student no longer receives this degree, which is of high value to them, right? So thinking about that opportunity cost of leaving as well. Any questions on, on this or me to can't quite see something or? Okay, so where are we at in time? Okay, so I think that should we work through every single one, I've thrown in some additional concepts. Um, so I wrote down some things that I would go over if I were you, and a lot of these come from the homework. So if I'm still, you're not gonna be able to read this, but I can write on it. If uh, it was me, you know, we worked through these problems in class, kind of reviewing some of, of what we discussed or kind of what your notes were on, that would be good. It'd also be a really good idea to go back and for each one of these homeworks, right, I've got an answer key that I posted. And I said, I'll post that fifth one um, Saturday morning. So reviewing those answer keys, because all those questions are kind of fair game as well. And looking at those homeworks, there's a couple, you know, this mainly comes from those problems, but a couple things that I would review. So I'm just going to rewrite these because you can't really read this very well. So one, I would kind of go back to that problem. I believe it's on the third uh, assignment or it might be the beginning of the fourth where you're looking at kind of the impacts of roster limits, right? So this is the idea that even if we have kind of this equilibrium wage, if I set the roster limit here, right? A potential that increases kind of, kind of wages paid to players um, as long as there's multiple teams competing for that player. Contract zones, we did some of that today. So there's also a, a problem, one of the homeworks. I think that would be good to review for that. But thinking about those contract zones and optimism versus pessimism. You could even, um, I would even go back and look at kind of salary minimums and maximums. Right? So this is the idea, you know, even if I have, you know, this equilibrium wage, but I say, well, look, I'm probably, I would focus a little bit more on salary maximums. So let's say I set this salary maximum, right? You can't pay a player higher than this. Well, the equilibrium wage should be up here. So that kind of forces my wage to be lower, predicts that I would see kind of a, you know, a decrease in that quantity of labor units. Um, what was the other one I have here? Oh, I would also go back and just know how to do those kind of simple normal form games. And primarily this is going to be those ones where it was like some scenario where there's this, you know, probability of success for the one player, which means the probability of the other player wins is, you know, whatever gets you up to hundred. So kind of reviewing those normal form game examples. I believe there was one in homework three and then another one in homework. Um, no, I think it was just in homework three. And it kind of also built in like, it, it, you know, the, if you, uh, there's a certain percent that you get caught using PEDs or something like that. So I'd review that problem um, and kind of just know how to set up those normal, normal form games. Oh, sorry. I forgot. You can't really read those, <laughs> set up those normal form games. Uh, I do think I'll have a couple questions that will be pretty basic, uh, but it'll look similar to the last two questions on homework five, where I'm going to give you a very, just one Y, variable, one X variable, and ask you to interpret what the coefficient means, right? It'll be a sports related example, kind of like the ones on homework five, something probably that links up to one of the papers that we talked about. Um, so knowing how to kind of interpret those coefficients, right? A one unit increase in the X variable will change the predicted Y value by whatever that coefficient amount is. Yeah, so, so I said I'll post them after it's, so the due date's tomorrow night, I'll post it Saturday morning. Okay, I'll get actually, I think I can have it set to release like at 1201 or something like that. So that was, those will be there for you following that. Yep. Um, so yeah, I would kind of look at some of those uh, kind of linear regression examples on homework five, even if you decide not to do it. Uh, going, going back and just maybe kind of looking at some of the slides related to some of those papers we went over. Um, and then thinking about the link between demand for the sport 
and wages, right? So really this was, I think we kind of worked on a problem similar to this last class, but if I give you a scenario, so let's say I say something like, um, you know, the NCAA starts paying its players, right? And its fan base doesn't get as much value from watching the games. So you would see kind of the decrease in the demand curve overall for the sport, right? Which would also decrease kind of your marginal revenue. Well, if part of your demand curve for labor is marginal revenue per win, you'll see a decrease in the demand curve for labor. And what that results in is then kind of lower wages, right? So kind of being able to be given something that impacts demand, right? In my scenario just now, I said, you know, the NCAA pays its players so the fans don't give as much value. They don't like the sport as much. So you see this decrease in demand. That also means that the marginal revenue kind of per game or per win is gonna go down, which is part of your demand curve for labor. So the demand curve for labor shifts down and then kind of lowers that equilibrium wage as well. But like I said, we kind of went through an example like that last class. I think I forget exactly what the question, but a lot of these kind of, you can kind of review by looking at that homework three and four answer key as well. And then like last class, I, I kind of listed the things that you should be going over as well. So the, that you kind of have now a pretty good set of potential topics that, that you could see. We've worked through a, really a problem almost a couple of these we didn't ha haven't done, but like I said, those are on the homeworks. We've done a lot of them in class before, um, but that's what what I would kind of lay out as ones that you should kind of go through. Any other questions for me? Um, no, I know. Yeah, so um, I think I'll wrap us wrap it up for us today. But uh, I'll mention a couple of things. <clears throat> so one, um, if as you're studying, you have any questions at all. Uh, or, you know, even if it's on an old homework or something like that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I will be somewhat available. I, mean, I probably won't be super responsive this weekend, but early next week, uh, and I will look at my email this weekend, so I will try to get out responses. It may not just not be, you know, within 30 minutes of your email, uh, but Monday, Tuesday, I'll, I'll, I'll be kind of actively um, working, and so I'll be around my computer and get you answers pretty quickly. Um, and if for some reason, I don't know what this would be, but if that Monday through Wednesday time frame, if like, yeah, I don't know, maybe you're, I don't know, had a surgery plan and you thought the exam week, you know, your exams were on Thursday and Friday, uh, please let me know as soon as possible. But, but I think having that 70, basically 72 hour time period should be a pretty good window for everybody. Um, I, it will close at midnight. So that means if you want the full two hours, you, know, you have to start by at least 10 on Wednesday evening. Okay. All right. Good luck studying. Um, thanks for a good semester. Hopefully everything kind of ends out well for everybody here. Uh, hopefully we get back to normal in the fall uh, and that you uh, have, a, have a good summer break.